Hi, this is Susie Nakamura, and don't be alone with Jay Kogan. Don't be alone with Jay Kogan. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Don't Be Alone with Jay Kogan. I am Jay Kogan, your host. Grateful to be here. Grateful that you are listening, whether you're driving, whether you're exercising, using my podcast to fall asleep. It's all good. I just need the subscribers and I need the downloads. I'm desperate for subscribers and downloads. If you know people in a coma, subscribe them to our show. Have their nurses download our show for them. I'm told it's very good for people in a coma. That's up to you, audience. Get more subscribers and downloaders right now. I want uh, to encourage you to email me at dbawjk at gmail.com with your suggestions, with your encouragement, with your bitter recriminations. Whatever you have to say, I will read it and I will respond whether I'm smiling or in tears, I will respond. So thank you for the communication. Communication is kind of more than half the reason I'm doing this in the first place, is so that I can reach out to people and talk to people and not feel quite so alone in the world. Yes, that's the title is also about that, not just me being a perv. Get that out of your head, people. I'm just a regular guy. Anyway, this show, as you know, is about me dealing with my problems with interesting and funny people. And today, the lucky person who gets to deal with my problems is Susie Nakamura, the great uh, television and movie actress and theater. Yes, theater. She's going to be talking about something that we spoke about not too long ago, which is she said she would be doing what she does if no, if there was no audience and she never got paid a dime. And I said, bullshit. Why would anybody do that? Performing is like a, a, a transactional act where you want to give something and have somebody receive it. That is part of the acting experience. The other part of the acting experience is getting paid to do it so you can actually make your living at it. She wasn't saying she wants to not get paid and she wasn't saying she doesn't want to have an audience. She's just saying she's that committed to her art that she'd do it if, if she didn't get paid. Art for art's sake. And I uh, am such a whore that I need to get paid in order to motivate me to do the hard work of writing anything. I don't get paid for this, but I show up for this, but I get I get free soda water. So there it's good for me. That that's enough. That's payment enough. And plus there's some people watching. There's an audience. So I don't know. I feel like there's a transaction happening here. People are getting something from it. But if people were getting nothing from it, it was just me in isolation, I wouldn't be recording the show and I wouldn't be writing and I wouldn't be doing the things that I do. So I want to talk to Susie about her commitment to art and about the rest of her life because she's an interesting gal and an adorable gal. So we will talk to her right after this. Don't be alone with Jay Kogan. Thank you for being here, Susie. Thank you for having me. Uh, I would have gotten to you eventually because my Rolodex is just going to go down. The but we were talking uh, at a uh, sad event yeah, together. Uh, yes. Uh, and and uh, at a funeral, and we were talking about art. And we're talking about Charlie, guy, kind of like Charlie wants to be a musician, mm -hmm. and then but he's worried if he can make money being musician be, or being whatever he's going to be. And and I said, I get it. I get how it is that when you're devoting yourself to a life of being an artist, like you want to know that you can make a career. And you said, no, bullshit. It's not about the career. I would do it for no money, for nothing. I would do it just to do it. And I said, nah, come on. And you said, absolutely. I love it. I do it for the love of the craft. I do it for the love of the thing. That's what you said. You were so adamant about I it. I did? I said, I okay. You were so adamant about it. You don't have to hold to that position now no, in, the light, I, in the cold light of day. <laughs> but but you did say art, it's, it's, it's what you love and what you do it for nothing. And I said, what about for no audience? Like with three people in there. I do it for that too. I just do it because I do it. And I, whether or not it's true now, whether or not. No, the, I mean, I mean, you're reminding me, you're reminding me of this conversation. It, and it was like, holy shit. I wish, I wish I was like that, that, that true an artist, that true an artist that I would do it even if no one saw it. If, you are though. No. Yes. No. You're doing it now. Well, I, I, I'm hoping that people will see this. I'm not doing it to just have it a souvenir, you know, a thumb drive with this show on it. No, but you're doing it now. Yeah, yeah. You're doing it. I'm, I but, don't know how else to say it. But, but, I'm, but I'm hoping, I'm doing it in the hopes that, oh, it is 
people are seeing it and people like it okay. and people want to tell their their friends. So you're doing this podcast. Yes. Right? Right. Don't be alone with Jay Kogan. Right. What are your expectations or what do you want? What is your dream outcome? Even though this is a process. I don't know. I don't even know what I'm doing here. I have no idea. I have no idea. I'm sitting okay. here with Ryan. He's a <laughs> podcasting guy. I made a podcast. I like recorded one with a friend of mine and my, my friend Keener sent it to him. And he said, oh, this is good. You'll be doing this. And I said, great. And I had no expectations except there's a secret hope. The thing that drives me is the secret hope that's, that somehow... People are going to see this and say, oh, I really like this. And they're not going to get bored of me in like four episodes, which I do with every podcast I ever listen to. But they're going to they're going to actually continue listening. And suddenly I will be uh, Mark Marin or something that suddenly I'll make gazillions of dollars. Like who is it? Joe Rogan makes gazillions of okay. dollars in his podcast. And by the way, I can go that route. <laughs> I can go the conspiratorial right wing nut job. You thing. could. Yeah. So if, that, if that'd I, be a great character yeah. for you. Not a character. No, I'm just going <laughs> to. I'll just buy into it. So, okay. I, actually, actually, actually I've, I've talked about this with uh, your ex-husband about doing a, a podcast just called The Truth. <laughs> and it's all lies. It's all conspiracy. <laughs> and just mm -hmm. doing the truth and seeing if I could adopt a character and just be that guy for a while. But the problem with that is I will be perpetrating evil. That's yes. the problem. There are some accounts on Instagram that they're, they do things in the extreme, right. but they do it completely seriously. So when you watch it, you can't tell if they're serious or right. not. And I, would, I love that. That's I like would, a little that's how like I would do it. avant garde. It's almost like guerrilla theater. Right. People are confused, but the people that know think it's hilarious. But I'm here with you. I'm here with you, not because you're interesting and you're a friend, but you're also a famous person. You're a famous person. I don't think you know what the word famous <laughs> means. Famous enough. <laughs> You're famous enough. You're on TV and people know who you are uh -huh. and they know your face from television and from movies uh -huh. and stuff. So that's, I have other friends who are not so famous, who I, I are not on because I think, hey, Susie will come on and maybe people will know who Susie is and then I'll get more people to watch and listen. Part of that is true, but the real truth yeah. I'm telling you okay. is that you, of our conversation at that memorial. Right. Um, and here's the thing, if you finish this process, let's say you did whatever, 22 episodes, I don't know how podcasts oh, go. Oh, we've done 22 episodes. <laughs> and let's say your friends love it, and right. you you have a good time. Right. I know you have a good right. time. I've listened to the episodes. Right. You wouldn't say, I'm never doing that again. You would continue. Jay, okay. I know you would. Here's, you you're like right. doing this. Hey, I, do, I do improv shows for no one. Yes. On a monthly, if not weekly basis, I'll for show year, up. For decades. But. There's a joy. I get something out of that experience. I get something out of that experience. I get to do the thing that we've been trained to do, mm -hmm. improvise, which is so much fun. And mm -hmm. it's this weird cult group of people that really love to do it. Uh, but I mean, I do it, but I, I don't like doing it for no people. I don't like it when Transformers are out there and there are four of us in the group and there's two people in the audience. That's no fun. I once did an Improv Olympic show for three people and one of them was the valet guy. Okay, who had right. just sort of stuck his head into the theater. I've done those watch. shows because I'm a show business is my blood. The show must go on, <laughs> right? But we don't like doing that show. It was fine. It was okay. It, it's a great story. Yeah, but you're, you're doing it and there's probably people in the audience go, ha! Just that, that like you do some. Did you stop and you never went back? No, of course I went back. Okay, all the time. you're making my point for me. No, Jay. I don't. Because, you're already this because person. Because you're talking about, you were talking about theater. You were talking about doing plays in front of people, and plays are different than improv. They require work and uh, auditions and rehearsals and, you know, m weeks and months of your life to get there in front of people to do this thing. Well, I remember the conversation now. Okay. I don't know if I said I would do plays. I, I don't know if I was. You did. I, you I said went plays. as far as I would do plays in my living room for no people. But there, there there's a creative part to what we do, right? right? You're a writer, but improv isn't writing, and I'm this an isn't actor writing, too, and you're an actor damn too. You. But yeah. like for Charlie, yeah. I think this is what I said. Did I did I give you a Debbie Gibson quote? Um, I I would have remembered. <laughs> Okay. And if you said Deborah Gibson, I would have been even more impressed. Okay. Years ago, obviously, in the 80s or 90s, mm -hmm. I, one of my best friends was a, 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 was a musician. And he told this quote to me. So I'm paraphrasing his telling of it. But he said 
that Debbie, in an interview, Debbie, she, De- Deborah Gibson, formerly Debbie she, Gibson. I think she's back to Debbie. Okay. She tried Deborah and nobody liked it okay. and she's back to Debbie. She said, if I'm not successful, I'm still going to do music. Uh-huh. What if you're successful in 1981 and then never again? She's still going to, she okay. said in this interview, right. she's still going to do it in her garage. Okay. And that's what made me, that's what made me think of her because you were talking about right. Charlie. Like, Charlie is an artist. He has it in him. He wrote music for this show. Yes. You didn't pay him. Oh, God, no. He didn't do it for I'm not getting paid. He's not getting paid. That's how it is. I think it was. I'm not going to put, tell him I said hi, by the I way. I will. Um, I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but I think he enjoyed doing it. Well, let's still talk to Charlie about that. <laughs> Here's the thing. I asked him to write a theme for the show. Mm-hmm. And he said, sure. And then about four months later, I asked him, hey, anything going on with the theme of the show? And he said, ah, I'll do it. And then about three months after that, uh, I said, hey, I really need the theme for the show because I really want to do them. And the reason I'm not doing them is because I'm waiting on the music uh-huh. that you're going to provide. And I went, okay. And so he then went into his room and- Did it in how long? Half hour? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a teenage thing. That's yeah. an art, not ne- necessarily. And they're great. Added. And I love his so music. effing talented yeah. that he was just, as human beings, we only do things that we have to do. I agree. And teenagers are sort of the epitome of that. Yeah. Like they're not going to do anything unless you have to. So that's a teenager thing. That's right. not an artist okay. thing. All right. Well, and he was the, thinking about it the whole time. You, you, <laughs> I'm not defending him. Have been on dozens and dozens of TV shows. Mm-hmm. You have been in many, many movies. Mm-hmm. You're successful in the world of acting, and people. You're a successful actress. I, yes. I'm not saying okay. that there's a the hierarchy of things, but you're a successful actress, and you've made your living at it in a way that people dream of doing. Um, so you come from it from from having felt the success. If suddenly that was ripped away from you and said, yeah, no, now you're not a pro. You're an amateur and that's just going to be you doing these things for free while you also work at accounting office mm-hmm. and that stuff. And you're st- and do you still stand by the idea? Of, eh. Yes. Not only do I stand by that, that idea, I did that. Okay. And I'm still doing it. I right. just did something yesterday. Um, ultra low budget. It was mm-hmm. for a friend of mine. Right. Um, you know, I don't know what the micro budget contracts are, but it was something like seventy dollars or something right. like that. And I said, just you know, the people who worked on it just sort of donated it that donated that back to the production. I, and when I was in Chicago, I I worked a day job and I did shows at night and I. But when you were in Chicago, you grew up in Chicago, and you were going to, I guess, college and maybe doing Second City at the same time, maybe? I left college because I was hired at the Second City. Okay. So, and but but even then, you're still sort of struggling and figuring out you have to have a job. Oh, yeah. Because they're not going to pay you. No, I worked retail. Right? So you you work, and uh, uh, I read somewhere Crate and Barrel. I did. I I worked at Crate Crate and Barrel. barrel. Um, So I get that. That's how when we, we begin... We sort of like, we will support ourselves and, and support our art through work. That's how you begin. But that, isn't that the ultimate Couldn't goal? Couldn't that be? Is it, but if that was the end, if then, if at, somebody at Crate and Barrel said, oh, by the way, this is as good as it's going to get. That's all you're going to get. And by the way, it's uh, Second City is going to, yeah, you'll be about three or four or five years, Second City, then done. Yeah. That's it. That's, all, that's it. Okay. So here's my question to you. Mm-hmm. Why do we have to merge art and commerce all the time? Well, we don't. And the best art, you know, people I've been reading a lot about trying to be more zen about your art and your work and they the process, it's the it's the it's the making of the art is the much more important part of the process, mm-hmm. not the result, not who hears it and if no one else hears it, we shouldn't care. We should just say this is I made this for me and put it out in the universe and see who likes it. Mm-hmm. That is a much more, you know, a higher way of looking at it. But I am, uh, 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 I judge my work by whether or not people actually like it. And if I wrote a script and everybody said, I don't know, not for us. And like person after person after person said, don't love it. Don't love it. What uh, are you I'd, writing for them? Though? I'd be I'd be hurt. Are you doing it for them? Or are you doing it for yourself? Sometimes I'm doing it both. In other words, I'm often 
and this is it doesn't work anymore this way. It used to. I was trying to write something that I think would appeal to a buyer, not just something I want to write, but something I want to write that's also in the mindset of the kind of things I'm hearing people are interested in buying. So um, if I was writing a show just about, you know, this, a podcast of Jake Hogan, <laughs> yeah. and I said, no one was going to want to buy write, that. Write what you know. No one <laughs> will buy that. But I can write a show about a family or about a guy who's been, uh, who's difficult okay. and, and, and find find some some life circumstance that I think is resonant to me, but also dramatically interesting to the buyer, who, whoever the buyer may be, whether it's a streamer or a network or whoever. Okay, I but I think I know you well enough where like I feel like you you like a lot of aspects of reaching out to people, talking to people, telling stories, telling jokes. Yes. And I feel like if the television and movie industry closed tomorrow. Which it might. It might close right? tomorrow. Uh -huh. You would still talk to people. Yes. Tell jokes. Yes, but I'd also be working at the accounting firm, you know? So like, what if the audience came last? But in the joke, the audience comes first. See, that's the thing. I'm a comedian, or I'm a would-be comedian or a comedy writer. I, if the if I write a joke and there is stone faced silence, that is failure. But I know you've done I've done shows where mm -hmm. you tell some real specific joke yep. about, you know They'll get it. They'll the, get specifics. No one laughs right. except one bearded guy right. in the back. Yeah. It's really satisfying. Right. Yeah. Like no, it can be. really satisfying. I, when I did when I ran shows, I would allow myself one That's joke that no one else got. But that I got, and I said, because the audience is 200 people, I'm going to show the show to hopefully hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. There'll be some people who get this joke. Okay. What if you just isolated that? The problem is, the part of the thing that I love doing is making shows. So I love working with really talented actors and really talented writers and really talented uh, DPs and art directors and all that kind of. And I don't get a chance to do it unless certain amount of people sign off on it and say, yeah, okay. I think it's funny, it's good. So I have to appeal to a certain amount of people. They have to like it. I don't have the power to just say, walk in the room, I am, hey, <laughs> hey fuckers, I'm Jay Kogan, here's your script you're doing. So the ultimate existence for you is yeah. to sort of combine, you know, your expression of art and, and, and making money so that you could do simultaneously and it's not just making money. It's the power. The, there's power underneath making money that gets you to make the project. I'm not writing novels. I'm writing screenplays and plays. So I want to get them made. And I want to get them made in the style of which I'm kind of accustomed, which is often cost mm -hmm. $2 million an episode to do. And I'm not going to foot that bill. And so like it's, it's a system. Now I can work in a new system, which is like YouTube and just like shoot your own stuff and go go for that. But I don't think I would have as much fun. Okay. I'm not sure. I also think because your dad was, you know, in this, so ingrained in this industry, the television industry, you know, so that you you can't unlink yourself from that. A little bit. Part. I mean, well, that's, I, I mean. But I, I also know it comes out of you. Like, you don't get paid to do, like, you had the Philosophy Friday series on Twitter. Right. Still do, guys. Philosophy <laughs> Friday, every Friday. You know, so like, episode that's 215. something you like reaching out to people. You like interacting with people. And I, I think I'm I making do. a lot of assumptions here. Right. But, you know, and you like learning about people. I do. I like, you don't I do like, that for money. You don't do that for exposure. No. And I like that because... That whole interaction, Philosophy Friday, is filled with kindness on a place, on a platform that's filled with hate. So I, yes. so I feel like I'm fighting the man with kindness. Like I don't, no one's ever insulted in that, in that, in that three hour Friday session. Yeah. Not a person. It's not all that funny, but it's, all, but it's, it's sweet and it's, and it's people feeling feelings and I, I, it's a different side of me. And you enjoy it. Yes. So if we boil down what you like, what what gives you joy to mm -hmm. a, like a like whatever's right. the residue at the bottom of a right interaction, a, a tincture, right? Then I prefer unguent. What the hell? <laughs> yeah. Then w when you do, when you create, mm -hmm. it will give you joy, and you don't have to worry about like, will I make money? Will people like it? Like when I leave an audition, yeah. And I, 
I, and I like the character and I know the, you know who the character is or at least think I know who the character is and I make you know choices and do and that and I don't get it right I don't care because what I have offered them the creative part that you know right. that that I contribute that is the best I can do and right. if there if it doesn't if that puzzle piece doesn't fit in their puzzle right. It, I don't take it personally. Well, that's the way to survive that, that job. It is, but that's what I have to offer. I understand. And that's good. And that's true. Uh. And that's mature. And that's why you get work is because you're going in with the confidence of this is something I'm giving that's good. And people, producers aren't watching you going, God, she's nervous and she's freaked <laughs> out and what a nightmare. But that's the process. That's the creative process for me. Yes. When I create a, create a character based on words on a page. Right. My job is done. How much, Whether I get hired or not after that is do you, not my business. Do you like self-tape? I don't. All right. Okay. Why? Um, my cat has not learned to read yet. Right. Off camera. Yet. Right. Um, and I like... Feedback. Interaction. Human contact. Well, I still do... I do self tapes and I submit them, but, know, but that's not the same thing as it is. It's a little bit like a guessing game, but right. at the same time, and look, it, it's a privilege to come from this place where like, I don't care what they think, but I wasn't as successful when I auditioned thinking, what do they want? And, and I have enough experience now to go, th this is how I want right. to do it. That's a non-winning game for an actor. What do they want? That is not- It's a non-winning game. You will lose that part. You will not give, because you have to give some piece of yourself. You have to just decide, actors listen to this. If you read a role, it's not what do they want, it's what are my choices? What, what do I have to offer? What do I see in the scene happening? What do I creatively see this character going through? Mm -hmm. And how can I then bring that attitude and ideas forth? How do I take these words and filter it through this singular version right. that is myself? Right. And then if, if it's not what the producers want, then it's not what the producers That's want. That's but at least you've done the, the job of creating a character, creating a moment, bringing something to life in your way with your vision. Yes. Fantastic. And it may be something that the producers never dreamed of, but then see it and go, oh, that's fantastic. And it may be something like, oh, that's exactly what we wanted. Yeah. Fantastic. And if it goes through your filter, no one else would have done that. Right. You're going to be the only one that that's has right. made those choices. Right. But then every line, every line, even like, uh-huh, and yes. right, and- uh, Even be, the breaths. Right. That is all part of what's going on in the scene. And those are all choices. And that's the best part for me. That yeah. is the that is the most fun for me. I and I know I'm 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 alone put on this, but I love auditioning. And maybe it's because I come from sketch comedy, right. maybe it's come because I come from improv. I love playing a character for two and a half minutes for either eight people at a table or two people behind a camera or whoever it is. It's just different rooms. And that is the most creative part of the job. Because after that, if you get it, right. then the director directs you, someone else dresses you, someone, you know. Right. But your audition is like, I'm going to dress, my, this is what I think right. the character will wear, this is what I think the character will, you know, sit or stand or do or breathe mm -hmm. or whatever. That's all you. Right. And then when you get it, then you kind of have to let that character go. Tell me what you, if you agree with this. I think there are two kinds of actors. There are actors who are two kinds of successful actors, successful actors. Okay. They're either people who are pretty smart, pretty creative and see the world and can then use their knowledge of the world and their knowledge of character to invest it into those things and, and choose line by line by line what each, what, what each moment means to them and the character they're creating, which is a difficult task and takes a lot of brain power. The other kind of really successful actor is a complete fucking weirdo who is just, <laughs> a personality in and of themselves. And when yeah. they walk into the room, they are that guy. And it doesn't matter if they speak in <laughs> in, in weird affectations yeah. or strange accents. It's just like, oh, we'll give that person anything they, they, to say. And then they'll, it'll be interesting when they say it. That actor, by the way, is very difficult to work with. Oh, horrible. And, <laughs> and to direct, forget about it. You're committing to never direct that person. You're just saying, yeah. okay. But both kinds still have a singular take. One is through creativity and vision and work, and the other one is just born that way. Both of those approaches are the audience comes last. Both of those approaches are like, I am doing this. I disagree with you. 
I think the first approach of the actor who is choosing each moment and each line is giving some uh, some piece of their own soul and putting it into the character and the audience. That's what the audience craves. The audience yes, doesn't come last but for that. I'm not, but I'm not doing that for a reaction. If I was doing it for reaction, I wouldn't make I would make only safe choices. I, I guess I guess I don't I don't think those safe choices are are um, ultimately what would get you the part. And if that you want success, you don't go. The, and it also also ultimately what audiences want because they're going to think you're boring. Um, so mm -hmm. so I don't I do I I think that the road to success and I'm sort of we're talking here a little bit about success driven. We started with that conversation. Six being success driven is in art is creating something that's meaningful to people and enjoyable to people and interesting to people and surprising to people. But to do that, you don't can't anticipate that. You just take the situation mm -hmm. that's meaningful to you, the character that's meaningful to you, and bring it on, put it on stage and put it on the camera and put it on the page and see where it takes you. Okay, so you don't have to say the names of the shows that you've worked on, mm -hmm. but are, the, are your favorite experiences writing yeah. the most successful? No. For me, it's all, it's that but, is also true. But no, fact, they, they the have not exclusively, not exclusively the most successful. But one, two of my favorite experiences ever writing were The Simpsons and Frasier, and they were very successful. That was very successful. They're crazy successful. I've heard of both of them. And shows. I got to, I, we got to do exactly what I'm talking about on The Simpsons, which is talk about our view of the world, mm -hmm. put it out there, not knowing anybody would like it or not like it. Did you and, care if they liked it? Um, we wanted it to be funny for people, but it was we, funny to you first. We knew exactly. We knew, but we did. There's a lot of things that were funny to us that we said, "Oh, that people won't get that reference," and people we we pushed aside. So okay. we, it, it goes sure. through a filter of stuff that's funny for us, but also there's a chance a good number of people will also get it. You know, and Frasier too, even though they were trying to be, you know, pretend erudite. You know, uh, they were still using references that people would get. Uh, will you t will you explain to the audience and Ryan what a Nakamura is in? Okay, so uh, Nakamura, and I'm I, you should be very proud of this. <laughs> uh, in in television uh, writing is a joke that you set up somewhere towards the some part of the of the script, and we the writers loved it so much. It's hilarious. It's hilarious to us. They're gonna do it again and do yeah. a callback. Do a callback. And do it a callback like, again, maybe. Like a runner, it's a runner. It's a runner. It maybe happened two, three, four, maybe even five times. The, and, and the Nakamura <laughs> is when the first one you do dies. And it's in front of a live audience. And you know there are four more coming. <laughs> there are four more callbacks to the horrible joke that you've done and you can't change you it. You can't change it. It's your fuck. It's part of the structure it's, Yeah, now. it's called the Nakamura. Mm -hmm. I don't know. When did you first learn this sad, <laughs> sad lesson? Uh, just for the audience, you, you should know that this is it's not, not based named on you. after. <laughs> it's based on a, a the, the name of a character of a doctor. Yeah. I believe it was, it's in Taxi, maybe Taxi. I thought it was Newhart, but it's-, it's uh, Maybe it, Newhart. It borders but, on urban myth now, yeah. but- It was one of the, a classic sitcom and Dr. Paging Dr. Nakamura <laughs> was supposed to be the laugh. <laughs> And it didn't happen. Nothing. And it and and scenes were based on it. Jokes were based on it. It wasn't just you can rip it out. You had to suffer through it. So everyone knew. The writers knew that mm -hmm. that only a terrible, 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 sad moment was coming. Uh, and the actors who had forced on stage to do it, were also waiting for the death joke <laughs> that was going to come. So I and and I don't. I don't expect a real answer, but do you think the writers wrote that because they thought it was funny or did they think that the audience would think it was funny? Oh, absolutely. They thought it was funny. Jokes don't go into a, a ever. I've never been in a rewrite room where everybody said, you know, I don't like it, but, but put, the bozos on the stage, they're going to like it. <laughs> okay. There's so many jokes to choose from. Why would you put a joke that you didn't like? The showrunner, at the very least. The Thought person it who funny. pitched it and the showrunner at least have to think it's funny. There are other people in the room who could go like, that's not gonna work. But the people who, the guy or woman who pitched it and the showrunner said, yes, I think it'll work. I think it's funny. And I think the audience will like it. There's no like, they're gonna hate this, but let's put it in anyway. I, the point I'm trying to make yeah. is I think there is something in you. Yes. And it has to come out. And I, I'm sorry about that. 
I, have I think there's a creative part of you that you have, you know, sort of like uh, linked to business and and making money and and commerce that we that it's difficult to unlink. But if you could isolate that urge or joy or or you know satisfaction mm. or accomplishment then you can merge it back into commerce. So we're in a world right now where almost anything could be a TV show. There's no limitations mm -hmm. to be in a streaming show. If I want to do a show about a guy who masturbated all day long, I could make that show. I could mm -hmm. pitch, I could write that show. And it's like, it's called, you know, you know, wank on ca captain. Yeah, wank on. <laughs> so it's a wank on and starts with this guy jerking off and then uh -huh. goes on and then he gets into a relationship, but he can't have a relationship because he likes jerking off. He loves too much. jerking off too much. And it's much. like, it's all the, and, no one at Netflix or or uh, Amazon Prime or yeah, Apple, it's... no one would go like, well, we can't do this. They might not like it, but they say, well, it, it, if you wrote them the log line, it's about a guy who jerks off and it's how it's ruining his life. Then let's have the meeting. They would have the meeting. <laughs> yeah. They would have. The, they wouldn't say this is too far. So you it's can do. It's easy to pitch. Yeah. It's easy easy to... <laughs> Listen, I have stories. <laughs> Uh, but like, what is the thing? There's been shows about murderers. There's been shows about uh, people who are pervs and people who are creeps and people who are murderers and 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 strange family dynamics that are upsetting. And but the thing that people like isn't sort of you know the concept. They like you know the concept of is like cop right. show, right. hospital show. Right. They like the specific point of view that like I don't know. I, I can only think of the bear because. I think I saw something driving right. here. Um, it's a it's it's a specific point of view. It's a specific experience. We most of us have not worked in like right. a kitchen and all that stuff. But what's interesting to the audience is that it is it seems to be like a, an ex a, a unique expression or experience that. But there's a universal part of it. Yeah. So for sure. your jerk off guy right. is. You know, we Clyde. maybe can't. Clyde. His name is Clyde. Clyde, I can't relate to Clyde, mm -hmm. but there's parts of of can relate to obsession, obsession, you know, addiction, whatever. sure, all that stuff. Um, sure, embarrassment. That's, that's what we love about Clyde. Um, that's why we're there. The yeah, tissue exactly. boxes in every room. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> His lotion budget my, is huge. Yeah, my mom had tissue boxes yeah. in every room exactly. for different reasons. Right. Does did your mom probably didn't do this? I find that older people, when they get older, leave tissues around the house. Did your mom leave tissues around? This is what um, women do, and I don't know if it's a specifically Asian thing to do or just an uh, older women, is they tuck it under the sleeve of their yes, shirt. Yes, put it in their sleeves. But then I, my, my Nana Pauline had tissues always in her sleeves, but also tissues like lying around, like tissue, balls of tissues, because she'd get older. Is that something she would use? It's like, I'm going to save this, I'm going to use it later. I can I'm use it twice. I'm not sure. It may be dementia. Like, I didn't don't realize I left it there, but I noticed it's happening, and I noticed my father doing it as well. His mother did it, and then my oh, father's doing it as well. Well, yeah, as well. But I, but go on. I, I interrupted you completely about <laughs> tissue boxes. Um, about the characters. We actually mimic our parents' behavior, even if we don't like it. Yeah, if, that's if we, true. If we haven't been shown an option, right? Another right. option. Uh, yeah, and even sometimes if we have been shown another option, there's something innate. We learn so deeply from them about who to be. And when you start using paper napkins and like balling it up and leaving, um, will you call me? I will. I think. I don't do that. I think I was really because it bug bothered me so much when my grandmother did it. And now that when my dad is doing it, I don't do it. But when it starts happening, I'll know it's the end. And then at that point, <laughs> that, 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 that it's time. It's, it's time. time. And you to, probably won't even remember my number by yeah, then. Yeah, know. okay. Will um, there be phones or just chips in our head? There'll be chips in our head. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. So let's get back to masturbating. Isn't that what we're talking about? <laughs> yes. No. You're, so you're saying, you're. I think you have a misconception uh, to me about what I already do, which is, I already take something I'm passionate about, something I think is interesting, mm -hmm. and I put it out on paper, and I try to put it in a form that I think people will buy or that people will also like. So not because I'm selling out necessarily, but because I think, okay, well, everything's a step. Because you want to share it. Well, I want to share it, but I want to get to, when I have an idea, I want to pitch it. And then when I want to pitch it, I want them to buy the show so I can write it. And then when I write it, I want them to buy it so that, uh, so that it, they're going to make the pilot. So that you keep And then going. I go the pilot, I want them to make the series. And when they make the series, I want them to pick it up from 6 to 13, and from 13 to 22, and from 22 to season 2, and all that stuff. So at some point, they're going to tell me to fuck off. But I want to get as far as I can before they tell me to stop. 
in that specific format, you don't want to like write a memoir of your incredibly interesting life. And God, our memoir is so boring. No, yours wouldn't be. Oh, it'd be so boring. You don't want to write a play. You don't want to. Why? Write, because you have you. What, have what's better about a play? I, I don't. I know. have the same problem with a play. You got to write the play. Got to get have people invest in the play. Have readings. You like telling stories. It, I know. I mean, I'm still telling stories, but I'm not. I don't understand what what you're saying that I'm not doing. But you're what you just described was so specific. You're writing a pilot. Get it, you know, shopping it around. Right. And da, 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 that's, da. this is. But that's that's what you have to do with a play. That's what you have to do with a movie. That's what you have to do with a book, a memoir. I still have to write the little memoir book synopsis and send it to the publisher in order for them to want to buy it and unless I want to self-publish on Amazon but the and then joy. I'm just like a shit head podcaster <laughs> who's just putting out a podcast that nobody's going to eat. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, shit. Hello, hello. That's us. That's hello, me. Hello. God damn it. Ryan got me into this. All right. Never mind. <laughs> Uh, I'm, so I'm doing it for no one, or I'm playing in a larger game of media and trying to get to the higher end of that. What is the joy though? Tell me what you enjoy. Making, the making, being with people, really creative people, and actually making the thing. Making the thing, so you shop it so you can keep going. And, right. you, want, and you want it on television so other people can enjoy it and you yeah. can keep going. Yeah, I mean, I may, I loved every every show I've ever made. I've loved making. I loved School of Rock. I love Wendell Vinny. I love Frasier. I loved uh, the, and not everything was successful. And I loved making the wrong guy or whatever. But and and things were met with different levels of of uh, people liking it and people not liking it. And that's okay. But I got to make it. So and I have so many things I didn't get to make. That okay. in each little one of them, I was glad that they're written. And a part of me is heartbroken that they're not made. And your question is, what do you do, do if you can't do that anymore? Right. If they said, no more making the shows, you can just write them and put them on a shelf. And I would say, ugh, that is horrible. I, that's a that's a form of, of hell I don't want to put myself through. I, but we, could we do readings in someone's garage and make each other laugh? That's a lot of work for a garage party that I could just put on <laughs> a comedy record of Bob Newhart and we could laugh anyway. <laughs> like, I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know, isn't it? It's the, if you couldn't act. If I couldn't act at all. We couldn't act at all, but no, you could, yeah. you know, you could act in your bathroom. I don't know if I would necessar necessarily keep acting, but I would, you know, tell jo uh, try and make my friends laugh. And I would, I would find some sort of other creative output. Right. It, it, you know what? It doesn't even have to be linked specifically to art either, like painting or music, but I would garden or crochet or okay. something. That's so hobbies. Are they art? Is that hobbies? If you're, yeah, I think crochet is called slow, slow art. Maybe not gardening, but the ultimate existence, Who's right? the greatest artist gardener? <laughs> Of um, all the of all the great gardeners, of all the uh, of all the great gardeners, I guess not. I, I guess, guess, but I guess it's like assembling colors. I know a landscape designer, so maybe yeah, that's no, why listen, I feel. Like and and walking through nature can be very spiritual and soulful and all that kind of stuff. But I don't know that. I don't know art. Art to me is a form of communication, and maybe that you can do it through gardening. Maybe you can through do, do it through uh, through crochet. I don't know if I would be as satisfied. You have something to say. You have something to say about the world. Can you say it through crocheting? Can you say it through, you know, what's the you best You can actually say? say it through pottery. I know that you could see people's personality in pottery. Yeah. All right. I think the question for both of us is, if all the toilets disappeared tomorrow, where would we shit? Yes. You're right. Right. Well, I mean, New York City has answered that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's right in the street. But it's right in the middle of the street. Not to continue in this mm -hmm. horrible metaphor, but uh, we would still shit. Yes, that's right. And I would still observe the world and I would still con have conversations that I think are interesting with interesting people. That stuff wouldn't stop. But the thing I've trained to do for a lot of years, mm -hmm. which is be a writer, director, actor, writer mostly, and every all those, all those other things are people who are sort of kind of willing to let me do because I'm asking, but not because they love me doing it. <laughs> um, but writing, they, they pay me. If, if I'm doing that in this form, I have to do it with the hope of it being seen by a lot of people and being enjoyed by a lot of people. 
It's such a specific form, though. And and going back to the beginning where I say we don't where I said we don't do anything unless we have to. If you were forced to not do television specifically, I think you would be forced to do something else and it would be great and it would be I tell you what I wouldn't do is sit alone in a room and write. That would not be what I ch- that would be not how I choose to spend my time. But uh, do, the golden age of television, I, I you know, I'm sorry, I hate when people say but yeah. and I've said it a lot. That's all right. Uh the golden age of tele- television was when they couldn't say do and say certain things so they got more creative. I think um limitations force us to be more creative. Yeah, I agree that that you need to have a uh, know sort of the the canvas you're working on mm-hmm. and what is where the edges are and what's okay and what's not okay. And network television has different rules or had different rules than streaming television. And kids television they worked on had different rules mm-hmm. and that's okay. All of that's fine. We work within those rules and we do the best we can with those rules. Sometimes it's very frustrating because go, oh, on uh, on the streamer, I could say this word, and on Nickelodeon, I can't. And and I think my audience, even though they're kids, wouldn't be offended, but it would be great. And and you think, well, you can't do it anyway. So I do love Sesame Street because they would always throw in a, a older joke. Yeah, well, I mean, so would uh, B- Bugs Bunny was always throwing jokes for Muppet, that I wouldn't Muppet get Muppet Show, Muppet Show, sure, Not but, a kids but show. those weren't for sh- kids. Those no, were family shows. Good. Those are family shows. But Sesame Street was absolutely for adults to watch too. I used to watch Sesame Street well into my, well beyond when I was should have. Ten years old, I'm still watching Sesame Street because I was entertained. Yeah. Uh, I like the musical numbers and I like the jokes. I still like puppets. Uh Uh, (laughs) The other thing that has changed for us too is because we're older now and I feel like a lot of, I do mostly television, you know, the, the landscape has changed for older people especially right. for comedy do you worry that the that it's drying up for uh for people? women for women <laughs> for older women for older people no because i'm i kind of look forward to my second act what would that be i don't know i would have okay. to be forced into it okay but, but if, i'm still on plan a which right. is grow up to be an actor right <laughs> right but you know like the people i know have who've been have had midlife, they call them a midlife crisis. They've been great. Right. I look forward to that, where I'm like, where I'm prevented from doing the only thing I know so that I have to do something else. Right. It's interesting also to me that you as an actor who came from comedy or whatever, you do legitimate acting. Like you've toured theater companies and done real acting. Like so many of my compatriots in the world of comedy improv is like, yeah, I don't study acting. I just do, I just do the part. I just try and do stuff. They don't, they don't, they don't think to do a piece of theater. They don't think to do. They could though. I, you know, I, I don't know if I could be objective, but I think any funny actor can do anything. I, I, I think, think if the, you can do comedy, I think if you could do improv, yeah. I think you can do anything. Mm, I don't not, know. Maybe not improv. Those, right. a lot of those guys aren't trained. Because you're not, those things are not necessarily, you don't have to be great at presenting a character. You have to sort of, you can hint at presenting a character and that's enough, right? Mm-hmm. You don't have to really be a good Tennessee Williams style actor. You can just talk in a fake Southern accent mm-hmm. for two minutes and then the audience gets what you're doing. But I was the, I was doing a monologue show and uh, one of the actors dropped out mm-hmm. last minute and they said, do you know anyone who could do this? And I called Pressman. Right. David Pressman, the great David, David Pressman. David Pressman, and he has not done theater. Mm-hmm. And I found this out right before we were gonna shoot a show in front of a live audience. Right. Um, and I said, would you do, you know, you, we don't have time to rehearse, but you would basically like sit there with the script and right. do it out loud and da da da. And he did it. I'm sure and he was great. he was great. But he's great. He was great, right. Jay. Yeah. And he has never considered doing theater or anything else he's a right. he's a television primarily right. television actor oh my god and his father is a t- is a stage actor right and who also does movies and tv who does movies well. movies yeah. but it was automatic for him right well he's very good he's he very was good so good and he commits and that commitment travels forward you can that's there's a difference between somebody sort of ambles through an improv and kind of winking at the audience yeah. and somebody who's there in the moment and being that character. And those are the people who I take, you know, I love, who just mm-hmm. really commit and they're straight faced and they're they're in it. 
that's great. And sometimes I can be that, but most of the time I'm that goofy smirking guy in the back. <laughs> like, oh, this is so funny. It's like, so, so that's, that's problematic for me because I wish I was more like the David Pressman who could commit to the, the real. With no rehearsal. Yeah. Compared to the people that have surprised. been rehearsing the whole time. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that, that uh, you know, you have actors like, like him and, and Dan Castellaneta or whatever who could just be the thing. Mm -hmm. They're fantastic. They're do fantastic. you get joy from acting? I do. I love it. I love it. And whenever I'm given a chance to act, I'm, I say yes so fast. And I'll say, I'll be there on time. I'll wear my own clothes. I'll know my lines. <laughs> I'll be the uh, very good. But I do get joy from it because I like to do what we were talking about earlier, which is be in the moment and try to figure out what each moment is about and be there and then do my best to commit to it. Now, the problem is my best to committing to it is not as good as other people's best to committing I to it. I think you shortchange yourself. Uh, I don't know. You, we will have a review of many of my, my, my roles. <laughs> I have, I've had success in certain roles yeah. and, and there, I, I get, when I get a laugh from the audience, I know I've committed enough for them to believe me. I, I'm on a ride in Disneyland. In Disneyland, yeah. there's a ride soaring over California. And I, they ask you to take your ears off before you get on the ride. And I take my ears off and I look forlorn or whatever it is. And they routinely, this is the pre-ride. I get a laugh from a room full of strangers when I do that. I was like, fantastic. I didn't, I didn't do, the danger is to do it, to overreact. And I didn't yeah. overreact so that I ruined the bit. I got shot in the head once in a movie and I died in that movie. And I got a laugh on how I died. And I did it as real as I could, but just delayed my fall for just a little too long. And I was so happy, like, okay, that worked. Fantastic. That reminds me, the show that I just talked about with Pressman, mm -hmm. I, I actually had a dramatic monologue. Okay. And I've been rehearsing the right. whole time. And I started to do it and I started to get laughs. Right. Okay, and how'd you react? I, put, I leaned into it, but you know. Right, that, did it throw you though? No, but uh, anyway, it was it was interesting because I, I I do survive on laughs as well, right. and I like if like yes, so I did this comedy thing yesterday. If I could make like the camera person like shake the right. camera, yeah, no, it's no, I don't want to ruin no, the no, but it's so great. Yes, it's a very satisfying feeling, and if right. I'm not in front of a live audience, like that's the only feedback I get, right, and so I. I, Nothing worse than a, a crew that's so jaded that they're not going to laugh at anything. I love working with crews that are there to have fun. And that's one of the reasons they're doing it is because they love yeah. uh, entertainment. And s many of them used to be actors and many of them were, you know, like, like people people come on sets like, I guess you were born a cameraman. It's like, no, they weren't born a cameraman. They were born to, they figured out, they wanted to be, they went to theater arts and they did a yeah. lot of things and they fell into that particular wing of show business. But everybody's, there yeah, to make everyone's something. Everyone's an audience, yeah. And everyone's an artist. Potentially, yeah. And everybody's there to make something great. So, I, but but to make those people laugh is a great joy. I, I love that. What yeah. I'm hearing from you, though, is that you aspire to do these things, and in my eyes, you're already doing it. All right, well, so so I'm deluding myself. In your eyes, I'm this fucking nutbag. No, who's... not not nutbag, but I, I think you're, you have, you, you, it seems like you have this want I want, I want to be, part of me wants to be this free, this actor or writer guy who doesn't give a shit about the result. And I just put on, I'm a, I'm a renegade and I'm my own theater and I'm just gonna do what I want and people are gonna like it and the people who don't like it are all jerks and the people who love it get me and they're, they're, they're right and everybody else is wrong. I wanna have that kind of attitude of, of like, you know, the freedom of, 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 I'm righteousness. I'm right in my in what my art, but I don't think I, art of art that way. I think art is is a negotiation in some ways. I'm I'm like I'm trying something and it it can, oftentimes doesn't work, and I have to revise it and revise it again and revise it again until I get it right. Can you think of it more of like what you get satisfaction out of? Well, writing so hard that I don't. Enjoy, I hate writing. Enjoy writing. I enjoy being done with writing. Most writers feel that way. Everybody, almost everybody feels that way. So that that part, of, but I get satisfaction out of it's show day and we're going to make it and we're going to put it on its feet. And even if there are problems, we're going to try and work it and make it better and see if we can make it even better and see what happens tomorrow and the next day. And watching it get better and better, that's fantastic. Or putting on or doing a movie where it's done and we're just doing the movie, seeing how we can rework the scene mm -hmm. to make that 
get better and better? Or what's the way we can hit the joke as good as we can make it? And then taking it once we've done it and then putting it in the editing room and figuring out, okay, can we make it funnier now? It, it didn't turn out as well as we thought or it turned out mm. fine, but can we make it better? Constant, the constant improvement using skills we've developed over years is, that's a great joy. The process though. The process. It's Not the, process. the product. It's the, well, the product at, the, is extra. at the end of the day, there's a premiere and people are going to see it and the reviews and that's the product. And I want those things to be happy too. I want those th people to then love me because <laughs> I did this thing. I want Everyone them to say, Jay Kogan, you. Everyone loves Jay you. Kogan, brilliant genius, Jay Kogan, done it again. That headline has never been written. <laughs> and I want that headline to be written yeah, everywhere. You, for, you have to do it first for them yeah, to say you yes, did exactly. it again. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Right. He's done it again. Uh, I'm still struggling with that idea of would I do it for nothing? Would I do it for no... Like, writing is so hard, I don't think I'd do it for nothing. I would act yeah. for nothing. I what if that's nothing. your second act? You think that now is a great time for an old, an old white guy to yes. get into the acting business? This yeah. is your time. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> this is your time. Perfect. We're, we're, we need another old white actor uh, to take the mm -hmm. spot of all the Middle-aged other... Asian women in comedy exactly. have had their time been, in the sun. It's been pretty sweet for you guys. <laughs> Come on, let's be, let's be honest. Like, I'm, I'm on the phone with Ming-Na. Yeah. I'm on the phone with uh, uh, Karen Moriyama. And it's like, like yeah. you're done. You guys are done. We've had a great run. <laughs> <laughs> Ming Na is supposed to be on the show. Ming Na says she's coming. I don't know. We'll see. She's great. She I played her sister yeah. in a, a ABC pilot. Yeah, she's. Do you know how many pilots I've done? I'm gonna guess one every year for the last twenty five years. I did one every year for nineteen years. All right. And then I did a bunch of. Then I got busy. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that people do. Pilot. And they used to be able to make a living yeah. by booking those pilots and say, okay, I made my year. I'm good. I'm, I made at least most because of my Because you would year. get paid double. Right. You're double your quote. Double my quote. And then, so then I had money. So right. that, so basically failed pilots was my day job. Right. And then I would do theater. I would do storefront theater at night. Right. For no money. Right. That's great. And or maybe, like I did a show, uh, a, a th 29 seats I did a twin and I got paid five dollars a show so you asked me what is that what gives you the most satisfaction what gives you the most satisfaction oh that's an interesting question how dare you throw it you, back at me right how asked, dare you right now I know you thought this was going to be just a softball <laughs> I sit here and you think but no now you're on the hot seat I like the creative process I like the creative process I like the creative process of just having words and creating a character. And if I'm doing live theater, discovering new things every night, not right. changing anything, right. but um, staying, you know, saying the same words, but making it different. Right. And I think the thing that forced me to do that was because there were, there were no parts for me. There were no right. parts written for Asian women who right. did comedy. I know so many of those white actresses doing those internment camp comedies. <laughs> Was so so unfair. <laughs> so, yeah. was so unfair. So I had to take away all the physical descriptions, all the descriptions of the character, right. and I was just left with the text, and that forced me to be creative. How well, can I right. make these words come mm -hmm. out of my, this mouth right. and make it funny and believable? But if I was white, I don't think I would have done that. Interesting, but I mean. You're, I would have, yeah. but you're you're Asian, of course, but you're also Chicago. You're also like like there's not there, there's like it's not a far th throw for you just to do a, a gal from Chicago oh. doing a thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can't get away when you look at me. I it's well, a visual it's, medium. I don't same know thing if you're with aware my, of it. with my beauty. <laughs> yes, yeah. people people they're see this put. and they're they go, put this, off. This guy can't be funny. He's too. This handsome. guy can't even be. He's too handsome. Yeah, you yeah, and no, Charlize are like you're too beautiful. Oh, well, we talked about Charlize earlier. I don't. Uh, I did a, uh, a a movie where I had to write jokes for Charlize Theron, and it did not go well because Charlize. Maybe my jokes were terrible. It's not. Maybe not her fault. Maybe it's also that she can't fucking tell a joke. I you don't mean know. Comedy legend Charlize yes, Theron. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I don't know. I love her acting. I think she's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Charlize, I want you on the show. Maybe this will hurt us a little bit. <laughs> maybe. I don't know if my shitting on your uh, comedy. Come chops. on the show and Come tell on, him. Defend yourself, Charlize. You know Charlize Theron. This will be in my memoir. 
I found her wallet once. I found her wallet once at the Beverly Center. Found is in quotes. No, it was sitting on a payphone. This is how long ago it was. Oh, it was sitting wow. on a payphone. And it said Charlize Theron. I, she wasn't famous at the time. <gasps> she was just Charlize. So my wife and I said, well, who's Charlize Theron? That's weird. And we had to go call SAG. She had a SAG card. Call SAG and say, we have this person's wallet. Um, how do we find them? And they, they, they told us her agent. The agent said, take it to this address. We took it to this address, the shadiest fucking like building you've ever seen in your life, and said, "Leave it in the mailbox." Wait, and, was it at North of Holly? Was North of Hollywood Boulevard, east of La Brea? Uh, I think it was south of Hollywood Boulevard. I think it was in, in down below in this okay, kind okay. of like below Sunset, like that okay. area, but close. And then we we would uh, we, we delivered it to her, and then never heard back for anything. That's fine. Sorry. All right. But I'm glad she got it. And she was, and I remember the name Charlize Theron. How, what an interesting name. And then she became a movie star. Yeah. And I've, I've seen her naked in the movies. Okay, you don't have to write a mem memoir, but when you tell stories like this, will you write it down as soon as you think of it? <sighs> That's not that interesting. But here's the thing. You're not thinking of a product. You're no. just writing it down. Yeah. No, I understand. I, 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 could write, I've, I could write a memoir. I want to do an episode of this show where I just have stories where I, I sit with a friend, Jim Colucci or somebody who yeah. knows about celebrities and just said, ask me names and I'll tell you stories about that person. But, and your personal stories come out in your Philosophy Friday sure. series and stuff yes. like that. It's all fascinating, all right. All right. Jay. I'm and fascinating. You, it, and people want to hear Susie, it. Susie, I'm fascinating. <laughs> uh, Susie, let's move on to the next sections of our show because okay. I think we've really milked dry oh, God, this yeah. area. Um, so the... I also just, I haven't done a proper introduction for you. Oh. And we're like ha almost done with the show. All right. Well, they but don't anyway, need to know. All right. Anyway, Susie Nakamura, a great actress, a very funny person, a delightful person, and somebody who I've been lucky enough to know and work with on many occasions. And, I, you know, you're great. So that's all That's all anyone need to know. And um, you're great, too. And that's why I'm here. I am, I am great. That's true. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll take that. Um, so... We do a thing, listener mail. It's time okay. for listener mail. So there's a theme. Now it's time for listener mail. Here's a question. It was interesting. This has come from Maynard. These oh, are uh, uh, listener questions. Name. And he's asking, if you could relive any year of your life, which year would it be and why? Oh, that's a good I know, that's a great question. question. If I could relive, I mean. I think I know the answer. I'm trying to think of like, if there's anything that I regret or if there's anything that I want to do over or if there's any sort of highlight that I want to do experience again. But, but at the same time, like the reason that it's a highlight is that it was fleeting. Right. But it's just like, this is your little sci-fi rom-com thing where you've been given a, a special uh, uh, tincture, as you used before, <laughs> and you can drink it down and suddenly transport yourself back to this time, this moment. Okay, I would probably say eighth grade. I was going to say, before your parents left us. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say eighth grade. Okay. Um. Not that my life was super shitty, but it wasn't great. So you would go back in order to make it better? No, I would just go back because I feel like that was a really, it was still difficult, but it was it was a highlight. I met my best friend in mm -hmm. seventh grade. Right, who was? It, uh, Connie, Connie mm -hmm. Munoz. Right. And we did uh, HMS Pinafore for our eighth grade, eighth grade production. Wow, the kids must have been crazy for that. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, the kids love Gilbert and Sullivan. Kids ran they away from that show. They could have done a million shows. Why no. do they pick the one show? They that... were chanting operetta, uh, operetta. Teachers are idiots. Okay, but I'm glad you had a fun time. You did it. Was it. fun, okay. yeah. Okay. And we did some bad things. I snuck out of my window. Right. We tried Marlboro Lights. I was gonna say smoke cigarettes. Yeah. Okay. It was just fun. fun what advice fun would you give that eighth grader now? I would have them, um, I would have that eighth grader um, connect with her parents more. Okay. But you can tell an eighth grader that and but, they're I mean, not going to listen. It's you. you. You can prove to her that it's you, that you're the same person. It's me from the future. Mm -hmm. 
take my word for it, you're going to want to connect with your parents. And here are some things you should know about mom mm -hmm. and dad that you don't know yeah. about them that may help you connect to them a little bit better. Also, Jay, I was a I was an asshole. Mm -hmm. Like that. So mm -hmm. that's why I want to tell. Was. I, my mother wanted to take uh. like a family portrait and I was pissed off about some don't even remember. Right. And I said, well, then I'm not going to the family portrait right. as a threat. And she goes, okay. And right. she did it. And she there's a, there's a picture of just her and my brother. Right. <laughs> All right. Right. But, you know. And how'd you feel about that picture? I was kind of fine. Yeah. I was kind of fine about it. But still, that's just an, it would be like, just do it for her. Right. Okay. But I mean, eighth grader doesn't want to do it for her. I know. Screw her. It's like, what about me? What about my feelings? I'm not being seen. I'm not being heard. This is the funny thing about your question, Maynard, is I would go back and I would relive it to try and sort of fix some mistakes and I right. would do the exact same thing. Right. And to prove that I'm, I, it was a, a still an asshole. Were you a confident eighth grader? Yeah. That's so good. You know what? It's like, because I started, um, we started working in seventh grade. Yeah. So I had money and I had a taste of independence. And so that kind of what made me, made me an asshole. Because when my mother said like you can't do this, I'd be like, okay, and I just would do. I don't it need anyway. your permission. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hate that. I would not know what to do with that girl. Uh, yeah, that would be out of control. Yeah, difficult. and so she would say like, you know, go to your room. I'd be like, okay, and I would just leave the. I would crawl out of my window. Right. And go smoke cigarettes with Connie. All right. That's terrifying. But. Something kids have to do. Like I'm, I'm wondering, and maybe Charlie's done it, but I'm wondering what his rebellion has been, what it looked like. Like I, he, he I can't know because I'm the dad, right? He can't. He has to hide that shit from me. Yes. And that's part of the rebellion. I mean, part but, of his rebellion is that he wants to be an artist. I guess so, but not really <laughs> because I'm all for it. It's great, good for him. Mm -hmm. But like he actually said to me on the show, is that like he wishes I there was more pushback from me saying, don't, I want you to be something else other than what you wanted. Don't follow your dreams. <laughs> so he could have something to fight against, but I didn't give yeah. him that. So anyway. Well, you, you know, conflict is good. Yeah. Conflict is good. Struggle is good. It creates character. It, yeah, it that's, creates a sense of humor. I run from the conflict. So it's okay. <laughs> that's why I'm, I'm here to not have conflict. But, Dif difficulty yeah. is good. Yes, of course it is yeah. good. But I've, I've lived such a cushy life and and been avoided. Then why conflict. are you so funny? It can't be that maybe, cushy, Jay. Maybe I'm not that funny. No, uh, ultimately, I don't. Maybe I'm not that funny. But it was. Uh, listen, I I had my own outsiderness. That's why I, my, maybe I'm funny because it was fat and it was like I had I saw myself as an outsider with with other otherness. And All so the I went stories are yeah. about outsiders. Yes, so that's what Clyde outsiders. the masturbator is the ultimate outsider. And yet he's the ultimate insider too. <laughs> because who who better to represent all of us mm -hmm. than this guy who only wants to seek pleasure. He only That's wants to have a little, wants. he wants to feel good Stop for a little him. bit in his life. Yeah. It writes itself. I know. That's a show I would never do. And not because the masturbating, you know, it's like, I just, no. Yes, but if you and me and Pressman yeah. and a bunch of friends sat in a room and just for fun wrote this pilot. It'd be great. It'd be fun. I bet we could yeah. find something. No, it'd be fantastic. I, anytime people commit to doing something, it comes out good. If you commit to it, yeah. let's the improv rule. If you commit to it, it yes. will come out good. And and my one of the things I teach in, in my writing courses is that uh, I'm a teacher at USC as well. Mm -hmm. But you said that very is, pedantically. Is, uh, well, they force you to. That's a thick course you take, and they say you have to be pedantic <laughs> as a teacher. And you sit for hours. Oh, it takes forever. <laughs> uh, is to try and write something to, to, that's bad. Tell me your worst idea. Tell me your worst mm -hmm. idea. And then we all talk about the worst idea. And by the end of the conversation, it's our favorite idea because yeah. we explore it and we heighten it. And My we, buddy, Dave Keckner, when we when we want to when people want to like brainstorm, but right. they're afraid that it's a bad idea. He says, OK, worst idea ever. Right. And he just gets the ball ro right. rolling. Right. It's a great thing. It's like, OK, here, worst idea. Let's just start. Right. Worst idea ever. It's yep. great. You answered Maynard's question, Thank which you, is Maynard. fantastic. Thank you, Maynard. Uh, we have something on our show we like to call the moment of joy. A moment of joy. What gives you joy? Like on a day-to-day -day basis, what's a th something that gives you joy? Well, lately- For me, it's <laughs> masturbation. <laughs> you and Clyde. Right. I write what you know. Exactly. Uh, lately, I have been 
because there was a writer's strike and then a a very long, a what? very long writer strike, and there was a very long. I'm sorry, you're what? always the a last writer's to strike. Know. They're always the last. To oh know. my god! And there was an, an actor strike, and so I started. I knew how to crochet. Learned yeah, how to crochet right. as a kid. I started crocheting again. Right. And and I discovered that it's part meditation because it's sort of like repeated right. motion, repeated motion, repeated. It it relaxes me it relieves anxiety but there's a creative part to it where i look at something and think like can i crochet that that kind of thing and joy to me is closely related with um bliss and stillness okay and silence not like roller coaster right. joy uh -huh. um so i've been crocheting a lot but the interesting part of that was that i already knew how to do it mm -hmm. and i forgot that i knew how to do it when you are crocheting, are you in in the moment of working the piece, or are you is your brain in a peaceful place that's just not on automatic exactly, but just you know how it's almost like a meditation. Like can, yeah. some some art can be like meditation, some hobbies can be like meditation, mm -hmm. and others are like I'm expending brain power. How are you approaching your crochet? There's two kinds. Yes. One that I do sometimes like if I want to follow a pattern closely and it's very like, okay, then you do two back loop only, you know, so you're following right. a pattern, you have to concentrate. But the other kind is like, if I make something big, like a bag or a sweater mm -hmm. where you start it and then you can just repeat it and I could do like put the television on or right. something like that. But I could also meditate like while doing the dishes and other folding laundry. Do you like big projects when you crochet, like specific projects? No, because I like the, end but it'll take me whatever a week or two weeks to do so something. if i asked you to crochet me a leisure suit <laughs> that would take a while it would it would take a while oh. with the fittings and stuff have you ever noticed that when you close your eyes your hearing gets better no is that that true you want to try it right now sure i hear things I kind of hear the same thing. Well, once they've been brought, I hear yeah, that guy. So, but, yeah. So I've noticed. There's a, there, you can't hear it, audience, but <laughs> there's a guy down the street yeah. talking. And when I closed my eyes, I could hear the traffic became more prominent. And then that, this conversation right. below the window came more prominent. I, I don't know if that's like an actual thing, but I've noticed that when I go. Well, your brain is doing less work when your eyes are closed. It's just uh, it's just doing the, the senses that it's feeling. You're, and so if I'm crocheting and I don't, and I'm, it's sort of a repeated motion. I don't have to real necessarily look all the time. I, right. I feel like I'm more present. It's almost like when you turn off one sense, the other senses become clearer. Okay, sure. Could you, do you do good thinking when you crochet? Can you I, think of good yeah, ideas? Yeah, okay. yeah, I right. do. It's just good. sort of, it quiets my mind. Yeah. And in the same sense, I've stopped going to museums with people. I've always gone to museums alone, but right. now I actually, uh, avoid I I, right. I seek it out right because when people aren't talking to me I feel like my right. eyes work better <laughs> I have a, I have a thing where I can only be in a museum for about I don't know 40 minutes and then I'm out do you go by yourself uh not all oh, usually I almost go nowhere by myself but if I, I would go to I would go to a museum by myself in New York or something like that. but mostly I go with people but I, and I'm okay to separate and then just walk around by myself for a mm -hmm. while if I really want to take in the art. But I do need, it's it's too much information and I do need to take a break. Oh, okay. Like we went to the Louvre and you know we went to that's Europe a, a, that's a not lot. long ago and it's like, oh, holy shit. And there's a, there's a great museum in the middle of Florence, Italy that's fantastic. It's like, and it was like, I can't, I, I booked a tour. It's like, I, I have to stop this. I'm done. You it's know, overwhelming. Overwhelming. Too much art, too much mm. stimulation, too many ideas are being thrown at me. Too much history, too much, you there's know. There's fun, there's chiller museums. I, I'm not dissing the museum, I loved it. Yeah, but love I just it. want to take in what I can take in. So You're a sensitive good. soul. <sighs> I'm so sensitive, I'm such a flower. You're, yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, I, I think that's that's it. I'm sorry I didn't solve your problem. You know, I, it's not a solvable thing exactly. I just went, I wanted it, and you told me, uh, wanted the point of view of the person who just said, like, listen, it's about, it's about the doing and it's about what we get from the doing. It's not about the end result. And I know that, and it's what I have to do anyway. I don't have control over the end result. Even yeah. if I tried to 
make the exact show that a, a viewer or a network or a streamer wanted, I'm wrong every time. So that's never <laughs> that's never an option. The option is only write what I love and then hope that I can form it in a way and explain it in a way that will make other people excited about actually making it. Uh, but And I'm such a fan of your point of view that I just want to make sure it doesn't stop you from creating. So it's that's not, what I want to encourage you to do, to just keep doing it. I do keep doing it because we need to make money. Do you, have you met my wife? <laughs> yes. She spends money she like really, it's fucking water. Really good taste. She is not, oh my God, she is like, it's not, when she says, L -l -l I'm going to cut down this month, she's not talking about cutting down <laughs> in any reasonable way. She's saying, let's spend a little bit less here or there. It's like, oh. I have the privilege of not being responsible for anyone else yes. either too. So right. um, maybe I'm less motivated. No, that's true too. Like I have a family yeah. and I have a, a, a wife and I've got parents and I've got relatives and things. So yeah, I got I to gotta work. Baby needs new shoes. Yeah. And so, so for some Yahoo to come in here and go, just do whatever you want and don't get paid. It's just the, sort of a, a privilege. But the advice of that, <laughs> the advice of that is, is sound in that it's, the doing of it that will, the doing it with, without needing the end result to be any particular thing is the only way we really can do it. It's the only way it mm -hmm. re will really happen. And Every, as I get older, yeah. just like I really want to seek joy more than right. thinking about, will this make money? Will this make other people happy? Right. right. I'm waiting for that act two, that very exciting act two. And I'm, 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 if I become an actor, it'll be all because of you, you said that's what I should do. So if there you, you go. like it. I do like it, but it's very, very, uh, the reason I stopped acting when I was a kid is auditioning sucked. You're at a point where people will say, Jay, will you do this? I know, people have, and I do it every time. I say yes, no matter how degrading the part. Let's put it out there. I don't, Jay I don't Kogan is an actor. He's open right. to parts. Parts degrading? Perverted, whatever it is, whatever I don't care. Tell I'll me be what there you want to do. I'm so excited right now. Yeah. Tell me what you want to do. You want to play like a doctor? Are you good at lawyers? Are you be a great like funny? I be any. I can be. I was. I've been a mobster. I've been a a, a, a nerd. I've been. You'd be a great best friend. You'd sure. be a great neighbor. Yeah, any of that. But I mean, that's. I don't even have to tell. Those are the parts that are going to be available to me. It's not. What about this? Yeah. What about you're the lead in oh, your own show? That's a Jay? huge mistake. Jay. That's a huge mistake. Wait, no. That's a huge mistake. Navigating, please. Navigating the world is, is a very close version of Jay Kogan. When does Jake it work? It's worked once. Kogan. It's worked once. <laughs> One time, Larry David is the star of his own show because he was a failed comic huh? and he ha just happened to create the most successful sitcom in the face of the earth and he became famous as a writer and therefore used his fame to put himself in a TV show. It worked once. I did the pilot. I did, I did the pilot of Curb Your Enthusiasm. All that money's coming to you every episode mm -hmm. because you did the pilot. Fantastic. Then I came back as another character. Oh, fantastic. Good for them. I asked Larry recently, why wasn't I ever on Curb Your Enthusiasm? So why didn't you put me on? You put worse actors, people who are not actors, mm -hmm. like just people, and what? And he just said, you're not in my orbit. You weren't in my orbit. I wasn't thinking about you. It's like, uh, how hard is it to think about me? Come on, Larry. So too late now, it's well, over. You, we're putting it out there now that Jay it's is over. a talented improviser yeah. and actor. I'm gonna get Larry on the show to explain himself why he didn't put me on the show. Um, oh, speaking of which, so the real reason you're here is because you tangentially know Tom Hanks. Tangentially. No. Tangentially. You're the closest person I know to Tom Hanks. Like you barely know him and you're the po closest person I know to Tom Hanks. You have to get to Tom Hanks so he can be on this show. That's your assignment. Okay. I don't know how you're gonna do it. I can't even call Nia to get to Tom Why Hanks. Why not? I don't know her that well. Uh, I don't know her that well. That's that's an assignment. Okay. You're gonna see what, uh, what that takes. Uh, thank you for being here. You were fantastic. You were lovely. <laughs> I knew right. that you'd be great. <laughs> and you'll be back again, even though you don't want to be. I'll force you back here. And uh, and I love you. And you're really a lovely person. Thank and you, Jay. Thank I you love for being, being my here. Life. It, it, I love being forced to think about things. And that's what this show does. Yes. It forces <laughs> you to think about things. Absolutely. Yeah. So great. Well, thank you. And thank you, audience, for joining us with Susie Nakamura. If you have any thing that you want to write in and tell me what I'm doing terribly uh, or what I'm doing well, you can write to uh, db... A W J K at gmail.com. Uh, and uh, I'll read your emails and respond as best I can. 
And go. if you have any parts for Jay Kogan. Do you have any parts? Write that email. They could be right there. And uh, go forth into the world. And there's a lot of great things to do. And share your life with people so you don't have to be alone with Jay Kogan. Don't be.